for me, uh, and this is mostly through A Course in Miracles, but you know, through unity in my childhood background in Christian science, is to instead look at the true nature of that person that I'm you know, feeling judgmental about or disagreeing with or getting triggered by, and to see, to, to see them as the same way that I am, you know, a, a perfect creation of God, you know, worthy of love and worthy of compassion and understanding. And this is the hard part, even when they are by all objective standards, not deserving of compassion and understanding, because, you know, clearly, not just in my opinion, but in the opinion of the people sitting next to me, we all agree that that person's crazy or wrong exactly. and we're right. That's when it's most challenging to look beyond that sort of outer surface behavior and sort of see see the the good that lingers in that person or that is is beneath the surface that may be screaming out. Hello world, it's me, Dennis, and we are in search of the new Compassionate Mail, the podcast and the movement. I'm Dennis Tardon. And I'm the producer of the podcast, along with the founder, Clay Boykin. Hello, Clay. Hi, Dennis. How are you today? Oh, I'm, I'm very well. I'm so excited about our guest that you get to pronounce I Neil's get last to, name. That's right. Neil Fireisel, a good old friend of ah. mine. Hi, Neil. Well, it's nice to be with you guys. It's great for you to be here with us. It's been a long time coming, and I'm really excited about you being here today. You know, on your journey, Neil, uh, one of the things that we're doing that we're on in search of the new compassionate male. And when we always like to know something about the evolution within Neil of yourself as a man, yourself, your definite, your, your sense of yourself as a man and, and this sense of compassion and what this may or may not mean to you. You know what I've uh, I've been observing myself over the last twenty to thirty years as I've been on the spiritual path, and maybe for me the the best way to just describe the evolution is just becoming a little softer, a little gentler, uh, looking upon others. You know, with rather than go walking into a situation with sort of a combative stance, you know, and ready ready to defend myself, you know, against the the dishonest guy behind the counter at the uh, automotive repair center, you know, and expecting the, that they're going to try and sell me something I don't need, you know, sort of walking into situations with a little less of this defensive, you know, guard yourself against the world attitude. So I've, I've softened up over the years. Isn't that something? Just the energy, you know, we, we what is it? Uh, you get back what you put out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It only took me about 60 years to figure that one out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and we all have our, our little issues, right? Our trigger issues, oh, the thing, just... you know. And, and there's always some place in which we sort of assume that we need to go out into the world, you know, ready for a fight. Yeah. yeah. So how in this time, how have you seen... What has been your evolution? Because here we are at the end of October. We're coming up to a presidential election. We've been in lockdown and all. What have you learned and learned about yourself during this time and, and get a sense of what is happening in the world? Because you're, you, you're, you're a spiritual teacher. You've gotten a chance to work with people uh, all over. So uh, give us some sense of what your perspective is. You know, I think maybe... Uh... I've gotten a, a pass on this one, or I've gotten, I've been in such a cushy situation that it hasn't been as challenging to me as others. I'm working from home. I'm an engineer. Everything's pretty smooth. Our kids are grown up, so we're not trying to like juggle, you know, young children learning with working. And so, you know, I've got a, a pretty comfortable situation. So I haven't had the challenges during this these last six months during the pandemic that most people do. Mm -hmm. So at least for me, that's, that's not where my challenges are coming up, I guess. So what are the, what are your challenges that are coming up? Because one thing I've found is that in my life and clay, you, we've talked about this open that, that it is, does not do, uh, it does not help to compare wounds. 
and to say, mm. my, you know, well, you know, I just have this little wound. And then look at how, how that, because, because what that does is it disempowers me from taking a step that might be helpful and supportive of others. Is that your experience, Clay? Yep, it sure is. Perhaps my challenge has been, sometimes we're challenged from the outside and sometimes we, we give ourselves the challenges internally. And so for me, you'd, you'd think that everything would be smooth and easy. You know, here I am, this cushy work from home situation, yet I have pushed myself maybe harder than, than I needed. That uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, five hours a week I got back that I'm not commuting, but I'm actually working quite a bit. I've been on a lot of, you know, deadline driven stuff and some mm -hmm. uh, high profile projects. So then I'm working myself harder. Uh, I'm pushing. I, I mean, I, you, I, my plan was to be exercising and, you know, doing yoga and, you know, lots of walking and hiking and, you know, some, and, and I haven't taken care of myself like I should. Uh, I've just been too caught up in, in, in getting stuff done. I have had a few, you know, been able to do some hobbies, but it's, it's, it's that desire to, to yeah. produce, to do something. And it's so tempting to have, the materials and be all laid out right here and I can just do a little bit more and you know I don't I don't I don't have to drive home or anything no interruption so I can work a little bit longer and then that gets to be a little bit longer so how do we take care of other people like the other people on our teams because none of us while I'm in the same position you are, Neil, in that that I work from home I get a chance to do it virtually and we have a, a, a by all by all objective standards, I live a palatial life. I mean, I had there, we have, we have, my wife and I each have an office. We have a bedroom, a refrigerator. I can go in and if I, if I uh, eliminate bodily fluids, uh, uh, all I have to do is push a handle down and they go away. <laughs> I mean, I can drink water potable water straight from a fountain from the from the tap i mean kings didn't live like this a little yeah. while ago and yet we're we're just solidly in the middle of the middle of of what would at one time be determined middle class you know what i i think we um we always find a way though to challenge ourselves that despite our, our comfortable nature, uh, like in this particular case with the pandemic going on and then the political situation with the election coming, we find ways to be critical and judgmental of others. And from our arm, our armchair, our, our comfortable chair to get ourselves worked up, get ourselves upset about yep. either people are doing too much, they're doing too little, uh, you know, you 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 can you can go either way on, on on everything pretty much if you choose to get yourself worked up. So I think as usual, it always turns back to what do we choose to focus on, and you know, to, to what extent do we want to live in that space of judgment and condemnation, and to what extent do we want to be compassionate and understanding, and you know, contribute to a uh, you know sort of peace amongst all of us. You know, it's 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 always a question: how much news is too much news? And you know, I, you know, I've gone through the obsession where it's like I wake up and I'm checking it out and I'm watching it through the day and you know, mm -hmm. getting pissed off and you know, why don't I turn the TV set off because I'm good, feel good being pissed off about this, you know? Yeah. And then the other is I walk away from it and just like go into another world, and you know, trying to ha find the happy balance. But I tell you what. When I was a kid in the 60s, I remember my dad saying this, and uh, we were watching the news one night, and there were these two news reporters that were talking with each other, which back then was a little bit different. And he said, now, Clay, listen, when the newscasters start interviewing one another, we're all in trouble. <laughs> and why was that? Well, it's, instead of just reporting the news, it's turned into commentary, you know, yeah. you know, Walter Cronkite would sit there and he would report the news. Hmm. You know? yeah. He may lend a little perspective to it, but he was reporting the news. Now you've got talk shows 
you know, and it, uh, we have a lot of. I mean, there there are opinions and other unrelated observations. So if 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 it is, you know, the expression, uh, Neil, that would you rather be right or happy? Yes. And and my need to be right. What you were talking about, Clay, about about uh, oh man, umbrage tastes so good. Oh, <laughs> give me that big hunk of that umbrage so that I can have that righteous indignation, and really stand up there and 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 tell them just how. Oh man, that that, there, that is an addictive substance. I had a little bit of that yeah. for lunch today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it tasted pretty good for the moment. <laughs> Thank goodness, though. Eventually, you know, we get tired of it and we yeah. realize, man, this is just not working. You know, yeah. I'd rather have peace instead of this. Yeah, exactly. And that's where and, and that's where I think that we're going. I mean, when in the role of compassion in compassion for those with whom we disagree, not so much on their what, but we're disagreeing on their how. And that's really the the difference for me. So that if we if we get an understanding of saying, hey, we all actually want very much the same thing. It's just the difference is merely how we're getting there. Yeah. It doesn't take but one person to get triggered to set the other one off, and there we are. We're spinning so, all Neil, how do you how do you deal with tr your triggers when when you have your own when, when they're happening in your uh, in your life? Well, a uh, couple things. One is that first of all, you got to recognize it because <laughs> very often we get triggered. We get into this this state of mind. We don't even realize it. You know, we're just sort of <laughs> we're in our self righteous condemnation, or you know. Or like I said, we're just sort of stewing in the anger and we don't want to leave that. You know, we want to uh, feel the juice, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So then eventually we're like, OK, you know, maybe uh, maybe this isn't working, you know, and we often recognize that because our, our body is tense. You know, we, we can't calm down. Uh, we can't, you know, very often we can't think clearly. So then we start to say, OK. And then then the real question is, how do you choose differently? How do you how yeah. do you move on from that? And uh, one thing that I'd like us to, to amble off into is that we can do a lot of mental gymnastics um, and we can convince ourselves, well, maybe they had a bad childhood, you know, and maybe that's why they're doing such and such. And that's why I'm mad. But, you know, I can maybe understand where they're coming from, you know, or or their background is different than mine. Uh, maybe, uh, like, said, like, like you said earlier, Dennis, that. We have the same end goals, but completely different ways about going about them. So maybe they're just looking at it differently. Mm -hmm. And so what I found, though, is that very often when we when we work through that line of reasoning, it, it, it works to some extent. But eventually, I think we need to take it to a spiritual level. And we need to look beyond, oh, we're just all different. We have different opinions, different priorities, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent you you just have different you know priorities of what you think is important, and so what I've done over the years, and it, what has really worked for me, uh, and this is mostly through a course in miracles, but you know, through unity in my childhood background in Christian Science, is to instead look at the true nature of that person that I'm you know feeling judgmental about or disagreeing with or getting triggered by, and to see to to see them as the same way that I am, you know, a, a perfect creation of God, you know, worthy of love and worthy of compassion and understanding. And this is the hard part, even when they are, by all objective standards, not deserving of compassion and understanding, because, you know, clearly, not just in my opinion, but in the opinion of the people sitting next to me, we all agree that that person's crazy or wrong. Exactly. And we're right. That's when it's most challenging to look beyond that sort of outer surface behavior and sort of see see the the good that lingers in that person or that is is beneath the surface that may be screaming out or whatever it is. So that that's really been the work for me over the years is uh, 
very often I can just convince myself, you know, through some simple human logic alone. But the only one that really gives me peace is to sort of see that person differently in terms of their, their true nature. That, that's one of the, the things that attracted me so much to A Course in Miracles, the definition of a miracle being a change in perspective. Mm -hmm. Show me another way of looking at this. Yes. And then everything that comes after that, whatever, whatever shifts, uh, not in my control, not that, and not really even my business. But show me, and that's where I think compassion, Clay, has such a role in it. Because I, because unless if I can't ha have compassion for myself, I find that 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 judge, I am more severe. I have more more judgments about me and my own life and my than I have anything about the, anyone else. Yeah. So I've got plenty of judgments against myself and far be it for somebody else to scratch in on one of those things I'm <laughs> judging myself just a little <laughs> bit and boom, they get all, all of it. Yeah. 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 That's self-compassion. You, you know what I've found is that there's, there's a, a beautiful sort of interrelationship and a virtuous circle that comes into a play when we, choose to look at other people uh, compassionately is that uh, as you talked about clay very often there's we do one of two things we either project our anger our frustration for whatever our circumstances are or whatever onto other people mm -hmm. or we turn it inwards and we blame ourselves yes and sometimes if we get caught in this sort of loop of of blaming ourselves and I should have done more. I haven't accomplished as much as I wish I had, you know, whatever it is, I blew that, you know, so we can go to circle the drain, so to speak, all by ourselves. Yep. And we can't seem to get out of that. But ironically, if we're willing to see the Christ in someone else, to see the good in someone else, somehow it gives us the permission to apply that to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so very often it's, it's, that's a good way to get unstuck. And so very often when, when people are feeling stuck, I'll often encourage them do something, some kind of volunteering, something to get outside of yourself, to share and give to others. And then it gives you unconscious permission to accept good for yourself. And then sometimes it's the opposite. You know, you, uh, you forgive yourself, you know, you start to look upon yourself a little bit more lovingly. Uh, and that sort of gives you the strength or the perception, the change of perception to apply that to others. But I find I, what I found is you can't just do one. It seems like that you they have to both work together and you have mm -hmm. to let that thing sort of go in a virtuous circle. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to talk a little about that with both of you on, on, and, and Neil, we can have compassion and and loving someone does not mean laying down and allowing them to completely take everything and and complete there 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 are boundaries there are important boundaries that we can set and the 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 example that i use that i like to use is charles manson and those of us who are old enough remember the manson murders and remember that he was he was the head of a ring uh, of uh, people who did some mass murders in california during the 60s and and what i had it is important to me that he is in a secure place that is and will not see the light of day, uh, will not see outside of that particular secure place, and that and that's and that's the boundaries there. I do not need to heap one amount of judgment on top of him. There is not; it does not help him, nor does it help me in doing that even though we're setting very clear boundaries so can can can, can you talk about that because sometimes people say well compassion just means that that you have you just allow everything to happen yeah yeah i'm glad you brought that up because that is very often that's the immediate pushback you get when you start to talk about this kind of stuff well what do you, you just want me to be a doormat just accept everything right. you know forgive everyone no matter the terrible things that they're doing 
Uh, and what I would suggest is that, that what we've been talking about is what we do at the level of the mind. And that we can still forgive someone, even though we completely disagree with their policies, what they're doing in the world. Uh, we have to make that distinction. And if appropriate laws need to apply, such that that person is either locked up or, you know, uh, they suffer the consequences of their decisions according to the, the, the rules that we've made up for, you know, this little spaceship earth that we all inhabit the, show, the social that, contract right yeah that's a good way to put it uh, and so so that that can all work but, but what i found is that we can we're even more effective in the world and we're even more effective perhaps in 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 our actions and we can choose our actions with a greater sense of peace and clarity and be heard and be more effective if we're coming from that place of compassion and forgiveness, even to those that, you know, don't deserve it, so to speak, you know, in, in, in the language of, of the ego, they don't deserve it. Uh, but but I, I think we've all probably seen situations where if someone comes at us just completely rabid with their agenda, their angle, whatever it is, we don't hear them. And people don't hear us if we come at them with a rabid uh, approach. Uh, and it's that forgiving, compassionate approach that allows us to act in the world even more effectively rather than less effectively as a doormat. But how, how, when someone attacks, when someone attacks me and I go into defend attack mode, my higher level thinking shut down. All the blood's out of my frontal cortex <laughs> and it's back here in the reptilian side and it's fight or flight, buddy. Yeah. How, 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 what do I do? What I found is that's just years and years and years and years of training. Yeah. And eventually we get to the point where when someone is attacking, now seldom do people really physically attack us. I mean, if that's happening, clearly we, we get out of the way, <laughs> you know, we run, we fight back, whatever we're inspired to do. Mm -hmm. Most sure. of the time, what you're talking about is, you know, a verbal attack or, a, you know, something like that. Uh, or difference of opinion type attack, or even the sly, underhand, you know, passive aggressive type stuff. Right. But what I have found is that I've become, over, through this practice of forgiveness and the way that I look at others, I become less and less likely to react that way when people, you know, are, are supposedly, quote, attacking me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it brings me back to something that I saw as a child. I was probably 10 years old. I don't know what it was. I was just flipping through the channels, looking at something, and some, some movie came on. And I distinctly remember this scene because it was so, the contrast could have been more uh, extreme. There were two guys. One guy was just absolutely livid. He was just yelling and screaming he was he was so angry. His face was red, like spittle was flying out of his mouth. You know, but what an actor he was. I mean, this guy, you know, it was just the the anger and the the rage that would just seething from him was like just palpable. And this other guy on the receiving end of this, you know, is I guess most of the time the camera was focused on the guy that was in rage, but you know, you could tell this other guy was receiving all of this. And at the end of this, whatever, one or two minute monologue of rage and anger and just frustration, the other guy just opens his arm and hugs him. And the guy in rage just started bawling and crying and he just melted into that space of compassion, love, understanding, forgiveness. And I'll just never forget it because most of us, all of our life, we're trained back. We're trained to just fight back. Yeah. If that guy's going to give me that much rage and, and anger, I've got to stand up and fight for myself. And, and that, that guy just opened his arms and just hugged him. Mm. Clay, isn't that, what we're talking about when we're talking about the lunar masculine, the rise of the new lunar masculine, uh, 
And this is we we yeah. we've been doing some shows yeah. uh, to reframe. How do we reframe how we're growing? And one of the ways that Howard Tice says talks about he talks about the within us we have this lunar and the solar, masculine and feminine, and that that we're the those any of them can go toxic, but but in having a balance between the solar masculine and the lunar masculine is what you just talked about, Neil. Is yeah. that this is this is the 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 compassionate male that we're talking about that can put his arms out to someone who is in such distress, even though this person is being yelled at and being and put and put and put their arms around them, is the what I understand. Do you understand it that way? That that is the yeah, masculine. It is, and and it's different than. And maybe it's metaphor, maybe it's not. <laughs> but I choose to believe when we we've been using the wrong language. I've been using the wrong. You know, it's my Me feminine. Too. It's my feminine side. Well, I don't want to be feminine. You know, no. What Howard is talking about is the energy from the sun and the energy from the moon. You know, the sun shines and the moon reflects. And associating the sun with the mind or the masculine, uh, the, the solar masculine, and then the lunar masculine is more reflective, that it takes both of those. And that gets the conversation away from man, woman, male, female, feminine, masculine. It's no, it's, it's me this way. And what it really brought it home for me, he said, well, guys, the lunar leads and the solar executes. And I said, okay, class over. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but first I thought, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm a man. Head, no. head, we lead with our head. No. No, it's, it's totally wrong because we always talk about leading with our heart. That's you, to inspire another person to move in a direction. I mean, we learned that in the Marine Corps. Yeah. I, I love that, Clay, because I need metaphors in my life. That, yeah. That's what helps me to go through the day, to be able to be active and to be able to be, work. Neil, you, you have to lead teams uh, and because you have to lead teams in order to accomplish very complex uh, algorithmic kinds of uh, operations in, in, in what you're doing. Are you... Are you seeing that opportunity to be able to bring more compassion in these in these encounters when you're asking for very hard deliverables or to help them to do? Can you talk about that? Uh, yes. And you may have to remind me of the question. We'll come back to that, but I'll address that in a second. Let me just... Uh, Sorry, my mind is still on the previous. Uh, Please do go for it. Topic. That's what. That's the way we want it. <laughs> Let's, Thank uh, you. This idea of you know when someone's coming at you with rage and anger, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you choose to respond, you know, from a place of peace. Someone may look upon that and perceive that peaceful reaction to be one of you know weakness or you know uh, giving in or not standing up. But I would say it's the exact opposite. It takes great strength to be able to react in that kind of a situation to, with peace and with acceptance and with love. Because uh, there's a famous quote in A Course in Miracles. It's the title of one of the lessons. It's, uh, it, the title is, In My Defenselessness, My Safety Lies. And it goes against everything that we learn in this world is that we need to be ready to defend ourselves at the drop of a hat. We need to be strong. We need to, you know, uh, stand up, fight back whenever necessary. But in my defenselessness, my safety lies. It's not talking about at the level of, you know, fighting with weapons or fists or even words. It means I know that I am invulnerable. I know that nothing that you say and nothing that you do can possibly affect me or who I am, that I am so clear that I am a spiritual being. I am whole and complete. You could even kill my body and it wouldn't matter that, that nothing can destroy the essence of what I am or likewise for you. And so when we believe that to our core, 
that allows us to not perceive the attack as a threat because we're, we're, we're coming from a completely different place of what we consider to be our identity and what it is that's vulnerable or not. And now, fortunately, I haven't had the situation where I actually did have to just worry about protecting my body from getting killed. It's always been of the verbal nature. Um, and so I've been able to, you know, work on this and, Trust me, I don't always exhibit what I'm describing. You know, very often I get triggered and, you know, I get defensive and, you know, I don't react well to the situation. And I'm sure we all do that. But it's something that we keep on striving to do and, and, and act in, in that way. And so maybe just to segue to the question that you just asked, Dennis, about when you're working with teams or working with others, uh, how do you... Maybe how do you carry that into just sort of our everyday exactly. normal normal cir circumstances rather than yeah. these extreme ones from a movie? Sure. Um, I guess for me, what's worked is just to see everyone from that same point of view and when they appear to be difficult. And difficult may just be like this little small resistance or a disagreement you know, I want to do it this way. They want to do it another way. Uh, you know, we're, we, we, you know, in general, we're all on the same team and we're working towards something, but uh, we may be frustrated with someone. What I found in that case, usually all those little nitpicky frustrations and um, judgments against others, very often those come back to the way that we choose to perceive others is the junk that our junk that we project onto them. <laughs> oh, isn't that annoying? Isn't that, you know, I, because I so oh, over and over again, I find myself getting so quickly to see that the people that I criticize, that what I'm criticizing for is is a mirror of something that I am, that I, an issue I have to deal with with myself. Sort of, and, and it gets to the point, this happens over and over and over again, it gets embarrassing, like, oh no, not again. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe I do the same thing, you know, and I've been judging and criticizing others on this for years, you know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. but there's, there's also an exciting sort of sense of empowerment that, oh, wow. Okay. Now I can choose differently. Uh, you know, just take ownership of this thing instead of, you know, just keep on projecting my frustrations onto others. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had the most wonderful example. I had, a um, a, our goddaughter was, uh, learning the clarinet. And she went all the way through this piece that she was working on and got over a minute into it before she hit a sour note. And I watched her just take a breath and start again. There was no judgment. There was, no, there was, there was merely, aha, I can choose. And she started. And that moment has never left me. That's mm. the way. That's the way when I make when I make a mistake or I make a misjudgment to let's take it from the top. That's beautiful. Now, why do you think that she was able to do that? Because so often when we do that, we make a mistake. Then we go into the self-defeating, beat ourselves up mode. Oh, I can't believe I did it again. I can. I'm never going to get this. It's hopeless. No matter how hard I try, I can't do it. Uh, why do you think she was so forgiving uh, of herself? It was, or... it was, I don't, to this day, Neil, I don't know. It was that, it was a moment of experience and she was working there. She was a preteen and it was this, you know, a pre, mm. uh, pre hormonal, uh, time. It was just that time. It was just that, that moment that that happened. Maybe she hadn't learned to beat herself up yet. <laughs> you know, I think that, I think you have, I think you're on it. I think it was, I think that's learned behavior for me. Did, did you have that, Clay? I, I think about the toddler. You know, the toddler tries to walk and falls down, doesn't beat itself up. It just gets back up and falls or down. Or do again. the parents around them. What do we do? What do we, we, we plod a couple, yeah. a couple oh, of yeah. staggering steps and then and we're going, yes. 
somewhere along the line that changes. Well, when we when we talk about Carol Dweck and her work with the fixed mindset and the learning uh, and the growth mindset, you know, whether we have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset, because a growth, a fixed mindset uh, rewards results. A growth mindset rewards effort. And which one of those two can truly get us to the places where we can uh, where we can be to have the kind of success that we need? Yeah. <clears throat> can I go back to the office for a minute? Yeah. So you lead a team of engineers, right? Yes. Okay. Do you do you feel like there's a lot of heart in your organization? You know, uh, I have been, I am blessed uh, that where I work at National Instruments, the the atmosphere, the uh, the values, the goals of the organization have always honored the employee mm-hmm. and rewarded people for uh, sharing information with others, yeah. for working well as a team. Uh, and so I feel like it's very, you know, most of the time it's just, we're all working together. We're enjoying the challenge of the work that we're doing. Uh, I distinctly remember a conversation with my college roommate. This is only like five years out of college. Uh, and he went to a consulting firm and he said, he said, Neil, it's terrible. I mean, it's just like, there's just, everybody's backstabbing. And if you learn something and you have knowledge and information, you hoard it and you hide it because if you can keep that to yourself, then you have an advantage over the other person. I said, oh, that's terrible. Because if we have some good information, we share it with others, and then that's good. Like that's looked upon as, as favorable behavior. Because right. now you're, you're helping right. others succeed. Yeah, lifting one another up. So yeah. I, I really have been blessed to be in an environment where it's you know, encouraged to be supportive and mm-hmm. grow together as a team. You know, it's, that's, that's, I'm glad to hear you say that because back in the 80s, in my 22-year career at Motorola, back in the late 80s, the, uh, the, it was a wonderful time because uh, Bob Galvin was saying, this is who we are. And the, at the most fundamental level, it's constant respect for people and uncompromising integrity. Hmm. And that's how we're going to play this game, folks. You know, that's and 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 that's not negotiable. And uh, one thing that I've learned along the way was something that I pulled out of the book, The Leadership Challenge. And what I'm hearing you talk about it kind of mirrors this because they talk about creating inspired vision and modeling the way, enabling others to act to challenge the process and encourage the heart. And those are upstream things to be done when the heat of the battle is not on and creating mm-hmm. that, that culture. I've seen it happen and I've witnessed it and, and it was the basis for, I'm not an engineer, but I was put in charge of an engineering organization. So the only way I was going to be successful was not by solving a problem or, you know, out engineering anybody. It was creating the environment. So yeah. it was the perfect situation because I was going to be successful. So if I could bring heart into that organization and create the environment like what you're talking about, where people lift one another up, then we all succeed. Right. And then when things do get challenging and you have deadlines and you have, you know, difficult circumstances, you draw upon that common understanding that we're all in this together and we'll figure out a way and, yeah. and stuff doesn't become personal. It becomes just a common challenge we work on together. There's it's a lot of grace in it. Yeah, there's a lot of grace in it. It's like you have an investment. You've made an yeah. investment and you're That's able it. to draw on the savings of the yeah, it, it, you, you're actually you you've made that investment. So you it's now the emo- have- yeah. It's the emotional bank account. Yeah. You're drawing on the emotional. You've built up the emotional bank account. Now things get really tough. Well, you've got something to kind of draw on. There's, and that's yeah. where the grace is. That's that was 
what and I'm don't saying. we need this at a societal level? Oh, yeah. To work towards the common problems that we face, yeah. <laughs> but, but together in the same way that we're describing with this team of people uh, at work with a common set of values and an understanding of what the goals are. Yeah. 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 That's what I that, that that's what I want out of this political process and this the, the place where we're going to be able to know what kind of uh, to be able to have these kinds of values as a country that this is who we are these this is the definition we get to redefine ourselves as to who we are uh, and I take some uh, I take some. Uh, this is the first time I've said this, but I mean, but I'm I, because I don't really know how to say it, it, but with American exceptionalism, because I believe that while we are the greatest country in the world for me, I believe each person and wherever they are can be have the greatest country in the world for them. And that it is my job to be and be I am so proud to be. Uh, a naturalized citizen. I'm an immigrant from Mexico, and I am so proud to be here and to be and uh, to be a citizen of this country. I want the country to be its own best self, whatever it is, without having to be in the hierarchy of better than all the rest of the places that we must do. And I don't quite know how to. Let me let let me try this. I submit that we are that way now, that every person has exactly what you're talking about within them. It's clouded over with fear. It's clouded over with fear, but that golden spark of divinity is in, 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 is in with each, each one of us. Yeah. And, and the, the trick is to be able to like, like Neil, what you're doing is creating a presence that allows that spark to come out. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's every one of us in every interaction that we have with every person is just trying to contribute to that, that atmosphere, that condition, that place where everyone can express themselves to the, to their fullest extent. Yeah. And that's our opportunity. And it's also our obligation. Because that, that way I contribute to something. One of the goals that, that Clay and I have is that is that every time we meet, whether it's just the two of us or whether or not we're on a podcast, we want to work to exit the conversation at a higher level of consciousness than we entered it. That's, a, that's, a, that's an actual, we're setting that intention. So how can I do it? How can how can I be more open to uh, learning and growing and being part of it than when I when when I entered it, getting yeah. a chance to spend time? Yeah. With mm. Mm. There's another favorite quote of mine from A Course in Miracles that I apply more and more so every day, and it's very simple. It says every encounter is a holy encounter. So if we can go into our day and recognize that every single person we interact with at work, on the road, in the store, you know, wherever we are, and perceive that as a holy encounter, then it it completely shifts our our, our thought process because we're no longer looking at, well, that's a person and this is an interaction that I need to get through or I need to win or I need to... (laughs) Whatever, you know, you just need to get something done at, at, a, at a business or at a store or whatever, even at work. Uh, that's, a, that's a completely different mindset than this, this little encounter, as short as it might be as a holy encounter. And whether it's a smile, a kind word, uh, a conversation that leads to, you know, something like, oh, you know, someone gives you some inspiration, gives you an idea, you share something with them that they needed to hear. Because when, when we're in that mindset, then this greater force, you know, whatever you want to call it, God, Holy Spirit, higher right. self, the universe, this, this friendly force will use us uh, to say the right thing, you know, to lift someone up. And yeah. so that's, that's all we can do, every single one of us, every day. You know what that reminds me of, Dennis? 
is our conversation with Dana in the parking space conversation. Now that may be kind of a, appear to be a stretch, but if I'm driven to get at this time into this parking lot and to go into the store at this time and anybody that's in my way is that's bad, I won't get a parking space, right? <laughs> but if I go with the flow and I, you know, my intention is to find the parking space and I swear within two or three spaces, there on the outside parking lot at Whole Foods, all the time I find my space. Isn't because I relax amazing? into it. You know, it's it's not that hard edge. My external reality will will over and over conform to my internal reality. If I think it's a oh man, it's a hard world and people are just out to That's get it. me, and I, I will experience that in a reality. So if that happens to me over and over and over again, then I know, well, how about if I go straight to the source and I work on this inner reality? What if I were to make my inner reality a more peaceful world? What if it were a kinder world? What, what if my internal reality were more compassionate? What if I offered myself the same type of, of care that I would be willing to offer to someone else, the same kind of give, give myself that kind. How might I then experience the world? Going up Mopac and I'm minding my own business and lights come up behind me, sirens. What do I do? I melt, I freeze, I get afraid and he goes by. Now, what just happened? came and went and the only thing that happened was my mind went bananas but the world out there didn't change it was all my perception of what was going on That's yeah I, of course i tell myself when i'm on mopac and that happens <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and i i love trying to uh, trying to have a sense of humor about my own yeah my own mellow drama and and just what uh, just to, to have a sense and just stand outside of myself. My, I'm very fortunate. My wife and I, because she knows I'm an actor and she knows how I have is that when I when I will say something that is untoward or I'm or I say something unkind or I or I or have some kind of an emotional reaction, I can stop and go. Let me have another take at that. Mm -hmm. Let me yeah. do, let, let me do another take. Let me say my line again. Okay, and then come and I and I step back and I re give the line in a different one. And then we're just and, and she is a, 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 is is a evolved at the level where she's willing to allow me to have us another take. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And you know, uh, Clay, just the fact that you catch yourself, even though your heart was racing. You know, the adrenaline was flowing. You had this oh crap moment, you know, as you heard the sirens kind of behind you. Just the fact that you recognize, man, I can't believe I did it again. Right. I can't believe I let myself get so worked up by that. That's the biggest step from unconsciousness to consciousness. Oh, thank then you. you then you can start to choose, okay, then you can laugh, I did it again, you know. Oh. And then maybe five times later, you see the siren come out of the background. And you think, you know what? Maybe he's not coming after me. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe he's on a call or something. You know, and you start to, I think it also it comes, one, as you start to ease up on yourself, forgive yourself. But it also comes as you change your perspective about this world to a gentler world, to a universe mm -hmm. that's out for our best good rather than, a world that's out to smash us and crush us. Right. And that that's a tough transition, but we have to transition to that internally and externally. Well, you, you use the word choose two or three times there. Yeah. And to recognize that we have choice. When I, and sometimes at my worst is when I don't feel like I've got choice, mm. that I'm backed into a corner. And that's the time for me to remember, no, I can choose to be in a different place. I can choose to look at this differently. That's one of the biggest things. You know, yeah, things can be going to hell in a handbasket, but I can choose how I respond. Exactly. 
I, I, that choice. I, I, I love that because, and, and I use, I keep saying that I want to channel my inner Sully Sullenberger, you know, that mm-hmm. when, when the engines go out and all, all that, and, and, you know, just to sit, sit there and, you know, we're going to be fine. Everyone hold on. We got this. And then just very calmly bring, bring, bring the plane down and do it because the one thing that would not have helped was him panicking <laughs> of all the things that he could do <laughs> running up and down the aisles going oh dear god the plane is in. wouldn't help yet that's my opportunity that's why i want i i want to i want to go uh I do this. and, and you, like, you know what sorry just what's, what's jumping please. out at me is that <laughs> We have to be willing to recognize or admit that sometimes we want the juice, we want the drama, we we want, and, and not only not only do we want it, we want everybody else to see it and recognize it, and either feel sorry for us or join the party, you know, and and they're they're, they're just you know. You want some drama in your life. You want some excitement. You want yep. some pity, some compassion, some understanding, and then just eventually. And it doesn't have to take years. Often that's the way it works for us. Is it takes years because you know I've seen some twenty and thirty year olds that you know get this way earlier than I ever did. That it takes a, a willingness and a recognition to say, you know what, this just isn't working. This isn't fun anymore. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to look at things differently. Yeah. Do you mm-hmm. see, Neo, I want to ask you in these last couple of minutes in that, do you see a difference in the willingness of these young engineers, these men and women and people across the gender spectrum who are who are in, uh, because I've been over at your place at National Instruments. I've gone there for mm. Toastmasters. I felt it's palpable. It's, I, I mean, there is a palpable sense of community and of, of, of collaboration and of, of love and support that's there that I felt it on your campus. So, uh, but the, do you, do you see it in these, in, in the young people that there is something going on? Well, yes, I am seeing that. And I'm seeing that in multiple places. Uh, you know, I'm seeing it at work, uh, and it's hard at work to distinguish, is it because we've created this environment that we find and we hire people who fit into that in a really ideal in, environment where, you know, we all work together? Uh, so so it, it, there, there it's hard to tell whether it's chicken or the egg. But I've noticed it in two other places. You know, our kids are 27 and 25 now. And they have a complete, them and all, and, and many of their friends have a completely different consciousness. They look at things differently. They look at the world differently. They, uh, both of our kids, they they don't trigger on the stuff that I used to trigger on, or they just they just already have this compassion towards others. They uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out where they got it. Occasionally, they're the ones that are in their sane mind when I react to something. Um, and then I've seen it in another place. Uh, so I've been participating in these Course in Miracles study groups for 20 years now. 20 years ago, it was a bunch of people in their, you know, mostly in their 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. And it was like people who had been around for so long. Got they're finally, finally ready to like look at things differently. Uh, finally ready to, ready to maybe grapple with these spiritual ideas. And then every five years, I've seen sort of the, the, the age group like notch down five or 10 years. And you start to see more and more of these, you know, 30 something year old, you know, parents or even these 20 something year olds. And they just get it like they, they might not be familiar with, you know, the book, the words, the terminology, but they're ready to get these ideas like decades earlier than than people were just 20 years ago uh, it's just it's just astounding and it's really encouraging to see you know these this younger generation willing to look at this world very differently and themselves and the idea of differences and the collective uh goals and you know what they want for themselves and others it's it's beautiful i have a theory when things were simpler and we would 
you know, go to school, expect to go to college, you go to work so that you can retire, you know, and, and, and life was more linear. I mean, there was wars and stuff going on, but, but things were a little bit more straightforward. The kids now, there's nothing straightforward. And for them to survive, I think they learn early on that they've got to bob and weave. They've got to look at this whole thing differently, and they, they can't as well go it alone. Well, that is where I think it's linear versus nonlinear. Exactly. Because they are wired. They are, they are digitally, their brains, they are wired nonlinearly. Okay, I think I'll have my midlife crisis at 19. Get that out of the way. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead and, and and then I'll go ahead and and you know, but but the, but it, it that's what it feels to me is that, is that they are and and they are much more nodal than they are hierarchical and much more uh, in this Oh God, Neil! This is this has been tremendous. I know we're taking our audience beyond our, our normal hour, but but I just it is such a pleasure to talk with you. And as always, Clay, is there anything in these last couple of minutes that that we have not talked about that that is on your mind or your heart today, Neil? No, I think uh, it's just well, maybe it's good to close on this note that despite the difficulties and the challenges that we see in society right now and all the differences, I think it's good to remember how far we've come in the last few decades that we have come so far that, that, that our children, as they've grown up, they've grown up where they, equality is just like, uh, of course, it's, it's not even a struggle. It's just like, why wouldn't I look at everyone with compassion and equally and, what does it matter? The color of your skin, your sexual orientation, you know, your opinion on this or for that. So I, I think that despite what appears to be sort of this extreme division, uh, a lot of that is being fought out by us old farts, you know, holding on for the last, our last stand. Mm. And there, there's a whole nother generation that's just like, Man, what are you guys getting yourself all worked up about? <laughs> if peace Man, think, were declared, how would I? What if I missed it? <laughs> what if peace has been declared and I'm I'm still <laughs> defending your island? <laughs> yeah, in the cave, still defending it thirty years later, right? <laughs> oh, Clay, thank you so much for for for. Mm leading this initiative and in search of the new compassionate mayo and and neil thank you for joining us on the podcast today for being part of this 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 beautiful process of learning that i get to learn so much and grow so much from these conversations and and clay thank you for having me along absolutely well thank you for having me it was my pleasure Thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of In Search of the New Compassionate Male. I'm Dennis Tardon, and we will see you next time.